Anyone who wielded a sword during the war died in the Great Orthodox Demon War. No one predicted that the war would last 13 years, an endless hell full of tears, lamentations, and bloodshed. However, that war ended suddenly, in one day, with an unexpected truce. Even 20 years later, the details of the truce remain a mystery. Both the Heavenly Demon Cult and the Orthodox Alliance seem to have agreed to remain silent. As time passed, new forces began to emerge within Jang. However, it is clear that some sects have also waned because of the war. We see a beautiful girl practicing with a sword. Her name is Shion, the second daughter of the leader of the Righteous Sword sect. Shion doesn't think she can cross the Seven Star Kingdom at all. We see that she's at a training camp and thinks that, in order to ascend to that realm, she needs to master the Scarlet Trace sword technique as quickly as possible. She keeps the sword in its sheath and comments that, strangely, her skills aren't improving. Suddenly, someone calls Shion. It's his sister, Rarion, and brother-in-law, Bike. Shion asks what brings them to the middle of their training, and his sister replies that someone from the Palm Essence Union has arrived, and that the young master wants to take part in this year's Dragon and Phoenix tournament with her. Shion is shocked. It is explained that, among the martial artists of the Central Plain, there are two tournaments that stand out as the greatest. The Heavenly Dragon Tournament, the largest martial arts tournament under the heavens, where sects, honor, and even lives are at stake. And for young people competing in pairs, the Dragon and Phoenix Tournament, an event for rising young talents. This year, both tournaments will be held in Wuhan. Shion thinks that pairing up with a random child would be bad enough. Imagine with that pervert. She says there's no way she's going to take part and asks why she has to get involved with a guy like him. Her sister asks her to stay calm and listen to what he has to say before deciding. Shion has always said that she wants to bring honor to the name of her sect, and if she is selected for this tournament, she will gain a lot of prestige. His sister continues talking, but Shion runs off, saying that there's no way he's going to do that. His sister is disappointed, and his brother-in-law tries to comfort her. In the next scene, we see a busy promenade, a large market. Shion walks by in a very downcast mood, reflecting that if he refuses the invitation, the Palm Essence Union can hold a grudge against his sect and attack it. They can do whatever they want, because they are a very powerful criminal faction. These people from this kind of sect live by deceiving and hurting each other, using schemes and dirty tricks to get ahead. Is this the Janggu that Xion has dreamed of for so long? Suddenly she hears a scream. Someone says that the leader of the Murum Alliance is there, an older man, surrounded by many people who revere him, even kissing the ground where he passes. At first glance, it looks like a play. Xion thinks that, even if it were a story, no one knows exactly how the Great Orthodox Demon War ended. Suddenly, someone appeared behind her and said he had similar thoughts. The Nine Calamities demonic technique of the Celestial Demon was also called the Invincible Demonic Art. In a hand-to-hand -hand fight, no one could defeat it. What's more, the Demon Orthodox War didn't end so trivially. Shion wonders who this weirdo is, who has started chatting her up. He even invites her out for a drink. As it's his first time in Wuhan, he asks her to guide him to the bar. Shion thinks, what's this guy thinking, with his innocent face? She tells him to stop being a bum, reminding him that she is a martial artist and has better things to do. As she tries to leave, the man returns and comments that ideals and chivalry were abandoned a long time ago in Janggu, which is now just a facade. This sounds pathetic to Shion, who holds back from giving him a sword to the throat. She simply comments that he still lives in Janggu and leaves, thinking that this place doesn't deserve such disrespect. The man doesn't react for a moment, but leaves too. The two go their separate ways in the big, busy fair. Meanwhile, at the Haiyang Inn, we see that it's very busy, with lots of people eating and passing around. Some people are talking about the rumors going around town and about the tournaments, discussing who the favorites are to win, from the Lord of the North to the Lord of the South. When Shion enters, a few people notice his presence. She thinks the inn is full, probably because of the tournaments. An employee recognizes her and asks if she isn't the Lady of the Righteous Sword sect. She confirms it, saying she's just there for a drink. However, he warns her that there is no room available, except for the special room, but offers her a discount because she is the best person in Wuhan. Xi'an wonders who spread the rumor about her being the best. She thinks that she doesn't normally go to this kind of hostel on her own, but when he opens the doors, there's someone inside, that same hairy guy who comments, Look, we've met again. If I'd known you were coming here, we could have come together. Sharon thinks that her luck isn't the best today because that's not possible. In the next scene, we see the hairy man already pulling a chicken leg, but 
That's not all there is on the table, my friends. The guy is eating an entire banquet by himself. He asks Sharon if she knows how to register for the tournament. And she, observing how much he's eating, thinks, has the guy been hungry all day? He didn't have breakfast at home, did he, buddy? Even so, she asks him if he really wants to take part. He says yes, he's convinced. He adds that there will be lots of beautiful women there. So, it will be great for him, because with his handsome face, women love him. He says he has proof, because he's been traveling since he was 10, and everywhere he goes, women like him. Sharon thinks incredulously, I wonder why I always attract that kind of person, huh? He seems to be acting completely different from before, when he used to talk super serious and political things. Out of the blue, he mentions that he knows who the most beautiful woman in all of Janggu is. When she asks who, he replies that it's his mother. Sharon exclaims, Oh really? But he retorts, are you disrespecting my mother just because you're getting old? Desperate, she replies. No, no, that's not it. She begins to think that everything is going wrong today. He goes on to explain why he's eating so much. He usually eats a lot when there's a big event waiting for him. Sharon asks if it's the tournament, but he replies that of course he's going to win the tournament. He's talking about conquering Rue later this year. Sharon wonders, what do you mean this guy is going to conquer the whole of Rue? However, he continues to say with the greatest naturalness in the world that when there's a lot to worry about, out. He gets very hungry. Sharon comments, Conquer Rue? Win the tournament? You're not being a bit conceited, are you? Until someone enters the special room and says that they heard a very familiar voice in there as they were passing by. Wouldn't you be the most beautiful lady in the Righteous Sword sect? The newcomer is Enol, the boy our protagonist hates. He has arrived with his entourage, ready to drink. Next to him is Inoa, his younger sister. Inol asks Sharon where she's been all this time, while staring shamelessly at her body, which annoys her greatly. But to avoid confusion, she decides to calm down. Inol, meanwhile, notices someone else in the room, and, on seeing him, throws a coin into the hairy man's food, saying it was to pay the bill. If you've finished eating, get out and free the seat, orders Enol. The hairy man replies that he doesn't think the amount is enough, not least because there's more food coming. Enol, annoyed, says he was trying to be nice. He looks at the hairy man's weapons and comments that he was being arrogant because he was a martial artist. Curious, he tries to lift one of the weapons, but feels a pain in his back and wonders, what is that weight? He thinks that if he looks back without his sword in hand, he will be completely humiliated. He tries to use his internal energy and manages to lift a little finger, but still comments, it's too heavy. Do you use this sword to train your muscles? Enol's entourage laughs nervously, trying to disguise their humiliation. Harry, however, takes the gun back in one hand and puts it on his shoulder, replying that it's not a training tool. Inal's group, unwilling to accept the humiliation, starts shouting, insisting that it was just a piece of practice equipment. Inal, getting angry, asked if the hairy man was making fun of him. At this point, Sharon appears to calm things down, saying that they are in a hostel and should behave themselves. Enol calms down a little and comments that the look on her face was very seductive. Are you interested in me? He takes her wrist and suggests that, since they are both going to take part in the Dragon and Phoenix tournament, it would be a good idea to get to know each other better beforehand. Sharon angrily draws her sword and declares that she won't take part in the tournament with him. Enol asks why, and she replies that he is using his family's power to force her into it which is an extremely pathetic act. He angrily asks her who she's going to take part with. Sharon has no answer, as she doesn't know either. At that moment, the hairy man intervenes and says that he's going with her. She's going to be by my side, he says. Inal doesn't react, and her younger sister, Inoa, asks the hairy man, Do you even know who you're talking to? He replies, I have no idea. Inoa, full of pomp and arrogance, says that, of course he doesn't know. The hairy man then philosophizes, There are two types of people. When faced with the unknown, there are those who despise it and those who are afraid. Somehow, this woman is demonstrating both at the moment. She's afraid of me, but she's trying to turn that fear into something that makes me fear her brother. That's a bit of a contradiction, I'd say. She says she wouldn't be so sure about that. Ingle comments that the little hairy man really has a lot of guts. And the little hairy man replies, I eat a lot, and they say that people who eat a lot talk a lot. But Ingle starts to get angry, to the point of cracking the stone table. Harry, however, warns him, be careful and don't waste your food. Ingle just straightens his clothes and says they'll see each other soon at the Dragon and Phoenix tournament. He then leaves with his entourage and his sister, before leaving, casts one last glance at the little hairy man, saying that they too will see each other soon. When everyone leaves, a tense atmosphere remains in the air 
and noticing Enol's cracked table, Sharon thinks she's in trouble. She also imagines that the hairy man will soon be in trouble. He then comments that, now that he has decided to take part in the tournament with her, he will need to revise his plans. Sharon asks if he's really going to take part with her, or if it was just a bluff. He confirms that he is going to review his plans, but Sharon, curious, asks, Review what? Don't tell me you're going to take part in the Divine Dragon Tournament? He replies, Of course I'm going. Sharon, surprised, asks, If you're so powerful, why didn't you beat up Guiol and his gang? He simply replies that he doesn't like hitting children, but she's suspicious, thinking it's just an excuse because he's weak. Even so, he goes on to say that these children are not the reason why Janil is rotting. Sharon notices that he suddenly makes a very serious expression, implying that he is telling the truth. Meanwhile, the people of Enol comment that Sharon had a crush on him and that she only did it to provoke jealousy. They believe that she would never reject their young master to go to the tournament with that hairy guy. However, Ingle reflects on the little hairy man, especially on his sword, which was very heavy, and that the boy lifted it with just one hand. He wonders, who exactly is this guy? Ingol is also outraged by Sharon's rejection and vows to make them both pay for what they've done. Later, in the Righteous Sword sect, we see that Sharon's sister is very upset that she refused to go to the tournament with the Enol. She has heard that Sharon provoked him. Speaking now is Ansai, the sect leader's wife, who mentions that she was already worried because Sharon and Enol were never a good match. Someone else comments that they don't want to see Ingol with such an angry temper, but the older woman says that Sharon is still young and that they can't force her to make that kind of sacrifice for the sect. Meanwhile, at the back of the room, Li Chu, the leader of the Righteous Sword, sect is reflecting on how his family is suffering because of his own faults. He thinks that if he had mastered more techniques, the sect would be even more powerful. The daughter says again that the situation is very serious and that they need to speak to Sharon immediately and find her. At that moment, Sharon appears, saying that they don't need to look for her. Her sister is very angry, and her mother comments that she was worried. Everyone is confused to see the hairy man with her. Embarrassed, Sharon announces that she is going to take part in the tournament with that boy. Everyone is extremely shocked, the hairy man being polite, bows and introduces himself. It's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Georg Ligon. Georg looks at a porcelain vase in their house and asks how much they paid for it. His father nervously replies that it was 150 Niang. Georg then comments that it's a shame because if he had been there when they bought it, they would have paid only 120. The father, even more nervous, mutters, Oh yes, Sharon, is that your little friend who's going to take part in the tournament with you? Sharon's sister, for her part, thinks that, however immature Sharon may be, it doesn't make sense for her to enter the tournament with a stranger. She then asks what sect Ligon belongs to. He replies that he doesn't belong to any sect, and that his parents are market traders who sell fruit near the Yumen Gate. Everyone, including Sharon, is shocked. She asks him about the swords he carries on his back, and whether he has at least mastered the art of swordsmanship. He replies that yes, he is exceptional, with both because his bloodline is so strong. Someone asks, Don't tell me you learned your sword technique from your fruit-selling parents. He replies, Yes, do you have a problem with fruit? Sharon's sister, still desperate, whispers in her ear that the first thing she needs to do the next day is apologize. Later that evening, Sharon is walking through the sex garden and reflects on her decision to bring Ligon to protect him from Enol in case he got too angry. But now, she doesn't know what to do. Ligon, who is also in the garden, comments that he can't sleep when he moves frequently and that he needs to do something at night. When he raises his tattooed hand, he says, I need to kill some guys out there. Sharon wonders if he's making a bad joke or if he's serious. And that story about his parents' fruit store, was that also a joke? She asks him what kind of people his parents are, and he replies that his mother is very nice. But as for his father, Ligon says that his father tries to take care of everything by obeying the rules. That's good for him, but his father also imposes these rules on him, and that's where the problem lies. His parents were against his decision to join Django, especially his father. Sharon thinks it makes sense. They must be worried about him, right? But Ligon says that, in fact, they were worried not about him, but about Django. Sharon then thinks, well, I think I've got it wrong. She reflects that her parents are worried about her too. Since they've touched on this kind of subject, Ligon glances at Sharon, who is looking a little downcast. He breaks the ice by commenting that she must have already digested the food, as she only ate vegetables today, and asks if her family will be serving meat tomorrow. Sharon tells him to stop being an idiot and says he'd better leave tomorrow at breakfast time. He looks at her and she asks, what's wrong? Ligon asks if she's worried about him. Sharon, embarrassed, replies that, of course not. She's worried about the kind of people she'll meet in the future because of him. In the reflection of the water, you can see Ligon 
Ramadan's little smile. Shortly afterwards in another sect, we see a group coming back from a campfire to rest. One of the guys is telling us that a boy, his hand shaking, tried to kill him to avenge his father. He says he had no choice but to send him back to his father. Everyone starts laughing at this horrible story. Another man comments that he did a good deed. He saved the boy from being an orphan. Then Legon appears and they ask who he is. One of the men asks, who is this weirdo and does he know where he is? Legon of course knows where he is on the black market. The man comments that, even though he knows where he is, Ligon has shown up there. He then warns him, this is no place for children. But Ligon replies that if the word little child comes out of his mouth again, he will die. The man stands up, saying that he was taking it easy because Ligon is a little child. But now he's going to teach him some manners. He lunges forward with his katana, but Ligon dodges easily and uses a technique with the palm of his hand, hitting the man in the ribs. Everyone starts laughing, thinking that the man is taking too long to kill Ligon, but when he releases the man, he falls dead to the ground, to everyone's shock. Ligon comments that he is at an important moment in his life, that this is the first day of his plan for the future, so he has no choice but to be firm in this situation. Everyone stands up, wondering what he's talking about, but before they can attack, Ligon is already advancing on them. He comments that he usually leaves these kinds of people alive to tell the tale, but today, they will have to die. He makes a cut that tears three enemies apart at once, and continues walking through the pools of blood. It wasn't the same scene as before. Now he had killed many more people. He had caused a massacre. As he slowly opens the doors, Ligon comes across an extremely fat man sitting on a throne, surrounded by several women. An elderly person is serving the fat man a drink. Ligon walks slowly towards him and comments that the atmosphere in the place is very good. The fat man takes a sip of his drink and asks who the new guest is, if he was responsible for all the mess. This man is Emperor Glutton, the leader of the black market. Ligon says he's finally found the most important person in the place. The Glutton Emperor bursts into a huge laugh, which echoes throughout the hall, making everything shake. He thinks that this skinny boy is trying to buy him and asks, where did that young man get so much money? Ligon simply asks, how much is it? The glutton replies that it costs 500,000 neong. Ligon then throws the money down and says, there you go, 500,000 neong. Can we make a deal? The glutton is impressed as he thought it was a bluff. However, he realizes that Ligon really does have all that money. He also notices that inside the bag Ligon is carrying, there seems to be a lot more than just money. The glutton asks, what if I raise the price? Ligon replies that he will be very disappointed. What if I kill you and take the money? Teases the glutton. Ligon replies that he would be even more disappointed. Then the glutton tells someone to do something and the women start walking towards Ligon dancing around him and casting some kind of spell. The glutton comments that he's going to disappoint him a lot today. We can see that the spell comes from a candle with incense, which is creating an atmosphere of seduction around Ligon. His face remains so blank that you can't tell if the spell is working or not. The glutton, however, thinks it's working because Ligon has gone completely still. This is the pinnacle of sorcery, the illusory dance of happiness, which paralyzes any man. At that moment, one of the women takes off her hair clip and tries to stab Ligon, but he manages to defend himself and comments, the dance was really nice. It just stopped being nice when they tried to kill me. He takes the needle and plunges it straight into the glutton's head, piercing the candle with the incense from the spell. The girls are shocked, wondering why the spell didn't work on him. The glutton, perplexed, begins to think about how Ligon realized that they were using soul manipulation. Ligon asks the girls if any of them are there because they like that fat asshole, and none of them answer. Then Ligon says, of course not, and tells them they can run away. It's no problem. One of the girls asks if the glutton will let them out, and Ligon replies that they must be very scared at the moment, but that they need to have courage because they can have a life outside of there, can't they? The glutton gives another of those echoing laughs and comments that Ligon is really impressive. He says he'll let the girls out, yes, but only after he's cut off some of their limbs. Ligon then asks if he's really going to do that and warns that if he does, he'll cut off the glutton himself. The glutton feels the pressure and begins to perceive Ligon's killing intent, as if he were standing in front of a sea of blood. When he comes back to reality, the girls are already thanking Ligon for freeing them. He wishes them a good new life. The person standing next to the glutton realizes that he is not well, and thinks that the glutton has been paralyzed by Ligon's murderous intent. This person decides that they are not going to stand by while the women flee. She uses a spell that makes her hand grow very large, so much so that the bracelets can't handle the size. Just by stepping Stepping on the floor, the wood cracks. He says he's going to kill Ligon with his special martial art, 
the body protection art of the glutton emperor. Ligon, however, comments that all this size won't be enough for the beating he's about to take. The first to attack is the glutton, but Ligon obviously dodges and quickly gets behind him. Even though he's huge, the glutton manages to react, but Ligon doesn't get hit again. He even lets out a chuckle, which makes the glutton even angrier. No matter how hard you run, I'll turn you to dust, says the glutton. But Ligon was already on to him and says that he hates these kinds of people, kicking the glutton in the neck and dropping him like a bullet. Glutton spits up blood, goes limp, and can barely stand. Even so, he doesn't give up easily and begins to gather more energy inside his own body. Ligon asks why this pervert was holding women hostage. He then picks up a pebble and kicks it so hard that it goes through the glutton's arm tearing off his forearm. Powerless, the glutton sits down on the rubble, thinking that Ligon really is a martial master. Nevertheless, he gets up and says he won't go down so easily, promising to kill Ligon. As he gathers energy, Ligon is already on his tail, preparing a powerful palm strike. The blow hits the glutton in the stomach, launching a beam of energy that goes through the castle, destroying all the walls in its path. That's enough to bring the glutton down. Ligon wasn't even injured, just a little dirty with dust, and commented that it was only fair since he had paid for the glutton's life. The dying glutton asks what Ligon is going to do. Ligon replies that he wasn't talking to him, but to the hunchback behind him. The glutton wonders what that good-for-nothing can do for him. Besides, Ligon could easily have caught the hunchback without anyone seeing in the silence. So, why did he do it? Ligon replies that he wanted a reason to kill that fat bastard. The glutton says that Ligon is even worse than he is, and Ligon agrees. Probably so, it's just that good people never fall into his traps. The glutton can't believe there's someone that powerful in Django, and at that moment, he leaves this world. After the silence, Ligon says that he has finally met Grandmaster Rua, or rather, Rua Mole, is that what I should call him? The hunchback looks and says that this name is very nostalgic. This guy is Mole, the former patriarch of the Phantom Mansion. Ligon comments that who would have thought that a genius in the arts of training and engineering techniques would be in a place like that now? He explains that it took him a long time to find his master because of this, and asks if it's that difficult for him to recover. Mole remains silent, and then we are told about the Ghost Mansion on Mount Chichi. Anyone from Django knows that this place is famous for the best machining techniques. Rua Musiol, who had excellent talent and a large family, was a man who envied nothing, at least until the day his only daughter touched an unfinished mechanical device, causing an accident that took the lives of his entire family. Musiol blamed his own foolishness, changed his appearance, and went into hiding. Now in the present, he wonders how he could ever forget that, as tears fall to the ground next to the blood. Ligon notices and comments that Musiol is a good man, a good man who has suffered for 10 years, and even more, for never having forgotten the sadness of having lost his entire family. Maul thinks Ligon is a very strange guy. He tried to save him at the risk of his own life, and it's the first time they've seen each other, yet Ligon still says these words of comfort. Maul asks what Ligon wants by buying his life, and Ligon replies that it's simple. He he wants to take over Django. Maul remains silent for a while and then gives a little laugh. He kneels down, revering his new master, determined to be devoted to him for the rest of his life. Ligon smiles at this and says that they're going to start work. Mel says, wait a minute, Zrinya, but Ligon is already putting energy into his hands. Mel has no idea what's going to happen. Meanwhile, outside, in that beautiful early morning, we see that someone is watching everything. This man wonders if his young master is still fighting. Back inside, Bouchot is wondering how it happened. He had heard that his body, transformed by the supreme arts, could not be reversed. How did he do it, he thinks, and we see that Mel is no longer hunchbacked. Honestly, he thanks Ligon, but Ligon replies that he'll use him from now on, now that he's got his little bones ready, so he should be the one thanking him. That guy from before, with the scars on his face, appears and says that the young master has really done it. This is Muyong, Ligon's personal guard. Ligon comments, Muyong, please shave off that beard. It's ugly. You look like an old man. Ligon introduces Muyong to Musiol and tells him that he will be guiding Musiol in what he needs to do from now on. He takes the opportunity to say that the plans have changed and that they will now start with the Palm Essence Union. Muyong is impressed by the sudden change of plans and warns the young master that this kind of person is not normal. He adds that, in addition, the young master is going to take part in the Phoenix and Dragon Tournament. Why have the plans changed so suddenly? asks Muyong. Ligon replies that you never know when someone's 
mind is going to change, do you? Mu Yong comments that this is something a playboy would say. Li Gong glares at Mu Yong and says that he's extremely jealous, isn't he? Mu Yong replies, Of course I'm not jealous, just because you're handsome, you have money, you're strong, you have all the women you want, but you still don't marry any of them. Why would I be jealous, right? Li Gong laughs and says, My goodness, you're extremely envious. Meanwhile, Mel is lost not knowing what to do or say. The next morning at the Palm Essence Union, we see that there are new visitors, but the guards inform us that the leader is away at the moment. The visitors are Sharon and her father. He asks when the leader will be back, but the guard replies that he doesn't know either. Sharon's father thinks that they need to apologize soon, before something really bad happens. He asks them to let him know as soon as the leader returns, as they will be nearby. Just then, someone comes out of the Union gates and says that he has also come to look for the leader, who is not there. He didn't expect to see such a well-known person. This is on Rook, and the leader of the Righteous Sword seems to know him, commenting that he hasn't seen him for a long time. He had heard that the leader of the Essence Union was demonstrating his power by inviting really qualified individuals, but it seems that he is being very selective since Ryuk is there. Ryuk invites him to have a drink, since there's nothing to do. The Righteous Sword leader accepts the invitation, saying that he won't turn down an offer. However, Ingol was watching them at the Spring Breeze Inn. Ryuk offers a strong and rare drink to Liksu, who feels honored to drink something offered by a warrior as powerful as Ryuk. Ryuk comments that it seems the leader of the Essence Union is very angry. Liksu replies, Next time you talk to him, at least say something nice about me. Ryuk tells him not to worry so much. He'll do him the favor. Meanwhile, Sharon was just watching the food, and in the background, Ryuk was commenting that fights between children are normal. Sharon was remembering that, earlier in the day, she had learned that Ligon had simply run away in the wee hours of the morning. She munched on a dumpling angrily, wondering why he had left her house like that. Has he left Wuhan by now? Later, Liksu was already thanking Ryuk for the meal and couldn't wait for the next one. Just then, Ryuk yells out that he's forgotten something very important and that it's an emergency. He runs out the door. We know why. It was time to pay the bill. When Liksu looks at the prices, he sees that the bottle of wine cost 120 niang. My god in heaven, he thinks as he calms down and says that he could come back tomorrow as he didn't have much money at the moment. However, the woman at the restaurant told him that she doesn't accept credit. Faced with the situation, she says that Liksu's daughter can stay there until he brings in the money he owes. Liksu asks if they are really going to take his daughter hostage, and the woman replies that this is just a side effect, since if he has no money, his daughter can entertain the guests. Liksu realizes that this must not be just a restaurant, since the people there don't seem to be trustworthy, even though they're more powerful. Liksu already takes his sword, until someone says, We've finally met again, haven't we, sect leader? We see that Li Gon is approaching, all smiles. Sharon asks what brings him here, and he replies that he's obviously come to drink. He slams the bottle on the table, and asks Madame if she's put anything in the drink because it tastes strange. Madame asks what he means by that, and Li Gon says that he heard that big people, big names, go to that place, and that she was selling fake wine to customers. At that moment, the people who were in the restaurant start to leave. Madame says that Li Gon seems to be drunk and should lower his voice, but he just laughs and starts shouting, This place is selling fake wine! Fake wine! Fake wine! Then the staff, the customers, start to get a bit worked up about it all. But the madam tries to calm them down by saying that it's just a drunk customer causing trouble. Ligon, however, says he can prove his point right now. If he proves that the wine is fake, he'll take all the profits she's made today. She asks what he'll do if he fails, and he replies that she can make booze out of his gallbladder if she wants to. A little later, everyone is outside. People start to wonder if this place has always had a back garden like this. Ligon comments that people are seeing that this place is very strange, asking, why would a store that sells wine have a hidden place like that, even with metal doors locked by a padlock. The madam replies that that's where they keep the wine, and questions why he's thinking that sort of thing, saying that there's no secret there. Nevertheless, he simply breaks down the door and starts taking out whatever is inside. Ligon takes a vase and puts it in the middle of everyone, saying that this was what the wine they call precious looked like. The madam, desperate, thinks she has to stop Ligon. Since things have come to this, she has no choice but to kill him, so she spits a poison dagger at him. Ligon, however, was already expecting this and puts the jug full of wine right in the direction of the poison dagger. The wine falls on everyone who was there, and huge insects start flying out of the wine. The insects start to fly and fall to the ground, and the people start to wonder why there are insects in the wine. Ligon, holding a bowl with some of the wine, asks if anyone still wants to have a taste, but obviously, 
obviously no one does. Everyone is very disgusted and some even vomit at the sight of the wine. Ligon starts shouting, does anyone want to taste this wonderful wine here? Anyone? Anyone? One of the customers, however, accuses him of being a liar, saying that he has never seen any wine made with insects. Ligon then explains that the insect is called Painted Coast because its back looks like a work of art. He adds that the taste of the insect's excretion is almost identical to that of bear bile, which is used to make wine. The people, hearing that it was insect excretion, are completely disgusted. Just then, someone else comes up and asks how Ligon knows this. The madam, shocked to see who it was, recognized the elder Yong Inung, the leader of the South Peak Alliance. It is explained that, 13 years after the Great Orthodox Demonic War, as all the territories were devastated by the war, a union was formed. However, the four great clans sealed their doors, and the demon cult went into seclusion. Taking advantage of this vacuum, four major forces established themselves as the main players in Jonggu, and among them, were the Supreme Family of Northern Heaven and the Southern Peak Alliance. This seemingly ordinary old man is actually one of the most powerful people in Jonggu. Ligon, not understanding what was going on, sees the people bowing to the Elder. The leader of the South Peak comments that he heard that the painted shore insects only lived in the South and asks how Ligon knows about them. Ligon replies that he has lived with them since he was young. The leader, impressed by Ligon's vast knowledge, asks who he is. Ligon introduces himself as Jock Ligon, the eldest son of the clouds and back of running water. The leader tries to remember who this cult is, but Ligon, smiling, reveals that it's just the name of his parents' fruit stand. The leader of South Peak, unresponsive at first, then laughs, saying that Ligon is really impressive. He thinks that perhaps Ligon is hiding his true identity. The leader's subordinate, Mawe, observes Ligon and thinks that if the leader of South Peak is interested in him, this boy must be incredible. Ma is the leader of the South Peak Tiger Squadron and decides to try the wine. When he tastes it, he cries out, complaining that it's the same wine they gave him and his leader before. The staff, disgusted, go after Mawe, demanding their money back and asking to have her head chopped off. While the madam threatened everyone, saying that they would die if they did this, Ligon watched the mess he had caused. Suddenly, Lixu approaches them and thanks them very much for getting them out of that mess. Ligon replies, of course it was me. Who else would do something as incredible as that? He declares that, from that moment on, he wants to be the savior of Lixu and his daughter. As they leave, Ligon suggests that they run to the nearest inn, as it's difficult to find a spare room. At this point, Mawe comments that Ligon really is a very interesting boy, but the leader of South Peak replies that he is more than that. He reveals that the moment he saw the boy for the first time, he felt a combination of trembling, excitement, and ambition rising up inside him, something he hadn't felt since the day the South Peak Alliance fell into his hands. Ma, for his part, thinks that his leader has never felt like this around anyone and wonders if the boy really is that special. At that moment, we see an abandoned forest where an injured person is running. She thinks she needs to warn other people as soon as possible. He has a head wound, all worn out, thinking that Jangu's fate depends on this information. However, we see that he is being chased by someone. He grabs his sword, thinking that this person is already very close, but the person says that he is from the Orthodox Alliance. The old man realizes it's true when he sees the emblem of the Orthodox Alliance and says he's from the Supreme Family of Northern Heaven. Knowing that he doesn't have much time, he gets straight to the point. He says that the Dragon and Phoenix tournament needs to be canceled immediately because a group called the Swallow Association is forging a big conspiracy in the tournament. The man from the Orthodox Alliance asks, this tournament is being coordinated by the Northern family. Why are you talking to me, a person from the Orthodox Alliance, instead of your superior? The old man replies that there is a spy among them and that he can't trust anyone. Suddenly, more people begin to approach. The old man offers to take the bait and asks the man to warn the others. The man asks, but nobody knows about this? The old man replies that he is the first person to know. However, it's too late. The man from the Orthodox Alliance turns out to be a traitor and beheads the old man. As the old man dies, the traitor reveals that he was mistaken. The name of the group is not the Swallow Association, but the Flying Swallowtail Association. Just then, a figure appears before him. He kneels down and introduces himself as the 16th Butterfly, welcoming the leader of the association. She asks what has happened to everyone, and the 16th Butterfly replies that the 4th is taking care of everything. The leader says that she knew he would do a good job, and is sure that the Dragon and Phoenix Tournament will become Jingu 
Grogu's biggest nightmare. Later in the evening, we see Sharon walking beside Ligon. He, as always, was thinking about food, wondering what kind of meal the sect leader would buy to thank him. Sharon asks him why he's always hungry. He replies that he's already explained. He's worried about a lot of things. She jokes, worried about winning over Roubaix? Ligon says that, among other things, he has that too. But suddenly he sees something and interrupts her thoughts. Sharon thinks that maybe he's feeling lonely because he came here with no one. Embarrassed, she thanks Ligon for what he did that day. She explains that Ryuk ordered a lot of things abandoned them in the restaurant, and left the bill for them to pay. Sharon thinks she still considered going to the tournament with that bastard. Ligon says she should go with him, as he's sure he'll win the tournament. She agrees, saying that it will be a bit difficult, but that she wants to put that ol, or inol, in the place he deserves, and that they will both do their best. Ligon, however, says that she doesn't have to take it so seriously, but if she wants it so badly, he'll support her. Before they continue, Ligon notices a jerk following them and suggests dealing with him. Sharon recognizes the asshole, and Ryuk asks if that's the man who wants to defeat Enol, the same one who made all the mess earlier and ruined Enol's plans. Ligon asks if it's Ryuk's hobby to check the backgrounds of the targets he's trying to kill. Sharon startled asks, Kill? Ryuk replies that Enol only ordered Ligon's death, not hers. Sharon, hearing this, senses Ryuk's murderous intent and begins to tremble while holding his sword. She has never killed anyone for real and asks Ligon if he has ever had experience in real combat. Ligon, however, steps back behind her and says, Please save me. It is explained that Ryuk is the master of palm techniques, and when he uses his skills, it looks like he has eight hands. This is how he earned the title of Monk of the Eight Flying Hands. He was once a hero who dreamed of a better Jangu, but when he saw how many villains there were, he realized that the difference between good and evil was insignificant, so he became a villain himself. Sharon thinks she'll have to face him alone, even with the huge difference in power. Ligon simply tells her to draw her sword. Sharon agrees, saying that she has to do it, that she can't just stand by and wait for what's going to happen. The silence that precedes the storm takes over the room. Ryu comments sarcastically, you're excited to die first, aren't you? He rushes forward with his eight hands. Sharon manages to dodge, but thinks he's too fast, and that she also needs to use a movement technique. However, her foot turns, she stumbles and falls. The eight hands come at her, but she narrowly manages to dodge them. Sharon reflects that real combat is completely different from training, and that she could die right there. From afar, Ligon shouts at her, you mustn't limit yourself to the moves you know. Let your body follow the path of the sword. It's not your foot that moves the sword, it's the sword that moves your foot. Sharon begins to think about it and focus on the movement of her sword. Ryuk, for his part, comments that Ligon is no one to talk to since he was hiding behind a lady. At that moment, Sharon tries to attack him but he manages to dodge. She feels intense pain and thinks that if she keeps pushing herself like this with useless movements, they'll both end up dying at this rate. She continued with a series of attacks in Ryuk's direction, but he dodged everything, laughing and saying that she was ridiculous. Those little childish tricks won't work against me, he says, and sets out to grab her face. However, she manages to jump away at the last moment. She doesn't think she'll be able to keep up this speed in the fight against him. Ligon approaches and comments that something is missing. The sword technique she's using is a bit heavy, so why are her movements so delicate? At that moment, Sharon remembers a technique from her sect, the Scarlet Stroke Sword Technique, which her father taught her. This technique involves a variety of changes in footwork and irregular sword play, and is entirely based on agile movements. However, Sharon hesitates. She's been training this technique for over 10 years, and now Ligon is suggesting that her movements are wrong. She wonders what he knows about the technique, since he was just asking her to save him. Ligon, however, goes on to say that, at the moment, she looks like a turtle stuck in the mud. On reflection, Sharon admits to herself that she really doesn't seem to have evolved recently. Since reaching the seventh realm of her cultivation, she seems to have stagnated. She doesn't get any more powerful. Perhaps it's time to change her technique, as Ligon suggests. She ponders. At this point, it's either that option or death, so she decides to try. At that moment, Sharon makes heavy yet simple movements. A strand of Ryuk's hair flies into the air, a sign that she has hit him. Ryuk, impressed at having been hit, starts to get angry. He lunges at Sharon again, but she blocks his attack with her sword, 
Even so, she is thrown away, appearing unconscious in the air. Ryuk, furious, says he's going to finish her off right there, but suddenly Sharon just disappears into thin air. He wonders where she went. Lee Gon appeared, complimenting Sharon on a job well done. He was walking on air, holding her. Full, he faces Ryuk in front of a beautiful full moon. Ryuk, trembling with nervousness, asks, Is this technique the steps of emptiness? Lee Gon replies that no, it's actually the falling flower step from the steps of heavenly thunder. He explains that Ryuk probably doesn't know much about his father's martial arts, as they have rarely been revealed. Ligon then steps gently onto the grass, places Sharon gently against a tree, and comments that his parents fell in love at first sight. He never believed in that kind of thing, but now he understands. Ryuk, trembling even more, wonders if Ligon has somehow rejuvenated himself, because he doesn't believe that a child could know this kind of martial art. At that moment, Ligon punches Ryuk so hard in the face that his skull cracks and several teeth come flying out. The force of the blow is such that Ryuk is thrown far away through several trees. Before losing consciousness, Ryuk can't believe what he's seeing. Lee Gon is on a level he never even knew he was on. He starts begging for his life. Lee Gon then asks Ryuk if he knows why he hates his own father. Because my father would forgive you, he replies. Lee Gon, frustrated, adds that his father is actually a very fair person. Ryuk, confused, thinks he needs to run away immediately. But Lee Gon continues, My mother always said that we would never live like that. And even though my father is very fair, I prefer to live by what my mother said. Suddenly, Ryuk hears a terrifying sound, as if it were a ghost. Lee Gon draws his sword, revealing it to be the Hellblade of the North. Without mercy, he unleashes a spectral slash in Ryuk's direction. Cursed souls rush towards Ryuk, who, in his last moments of life, wonders what is happening. But it's too late. He is torn to pieces. Ligon comments that his father's principles are very irritating. A little later, we see Ligon singing quietly as he walks through a swamp, carrying Sharon on his back. His singing, although quiet, causes Sharon to wake up slowly. He notices and asks if she's awake. She asks him to get down, but he replies that it's all right, that she's still hurt. Confused, she asks what happened. Ligon explains that that bastard, Ryuk, was unlucky. Who would have thought that he would die by the sword you wielded, even with his eyes closed? Ligon goes on to say that he finished Ryuk off after the sharp attack Sharon made, even though he was unconscious. Sharon is shocked, thinking that he's really dead. Ligon then says, Unless he's a zombie, he's dead. I stabbed his heart out. Sharon reflects on Ryuk's death and feels a little responsible for it. Ligon notices that she's starting to tremble, so he tells her that she shouldn't worry. That man deserved the death he got. Ligon adds that drawing a sword without intending to use it is disrespectful to the sword. Sharon hearing this thinks that Ligon is a very mysterious man. He seems emotionless, but suddenly he turns into a completely different person. Suddenly, Ligon says, it's already started. Sharon, confused, asks what has started, and he replies, the start of my great world domination tournament. Sharon, incredulous, simply replies, oh, yes, of course, world domination. 